invite you to take out your message outlines that are found right there in your program. Also, if you're following along on the church app, the notes are loaded there as well. Uh, we're continuing our journey, which is really a survey of the book of Mark. No, just making sure you're listening. Which book we're doing? James. Very good. All right, there you go. There you go. The book of James, just making sure you're listening. The great book of James, the epistle of James, is short five-chapter book that is filled with a lot of practical wisdom that we could use. And as we know, this epistle, this letter was written from Jerusalem to primarily Jewish believers during a time of persecution. And so the book puts forth a lot of practical information that we could use right now in our life all these years later. And if you recall, last week we talked about how God could, by his grace, help us to answer the trials that are in our life, the adversity that comes our way. And today we're going to be discussing another relevant area here in chapter one, and that is temptation. Everyone is tempted. You don't ever get to an age when you stop being tempted. As long as your mind is working and your heart is ticking and you're drawing breath, I got some maybe not so great news for you. You're going to experience temptation. But I'm so glad that God gives us practical counsel on just like last week, not only responding to trials, but responding to temptation. And so the focal point when you study James and you go through the different passages and chapters, you see the message of genuineness put forth, genuine faith, genuine wisdom, genuinely walking with God. And here we provide and we see that genuine counsel is given to those who want to advance past temptation. See, uh, some people lament in their temptation. Some people compare war stories. I'm tempted this, and I have it this bad, and I have it that bad. If that's your mindset, you're going to stay right where you are, and you're going to succumb to those temptations. But if you're going to overcome, if you're going to ascend, if you're going to rise above it all, if you're going to advance past your temptation, we're going to want to take notice of what God says through his word here in the book of James. And so here, uh, we're going to look at verses that take aim at this clear and really present danger called temptation. And so turn with me to the first chapter of James, James chapter 1, starting in verse 13. We're picking up right where we left off last week. And as you find your place there, again, follow right along with the notes, and hopefully uh, this could be an encouragement to you. Let's start off by reading here um, what's before us, starting in verse 13. Listen to what it says. Sounds familiar like the opening verses. Let no one say, notice when, circle that word there. What is it? When, not if, not if trials are going to come or when temptation is going to come. Um, no, it's definitely going to happen. So when he is tempted, now circle the word tempted. It comes from the Greek word parasimos, and it's very similar to the word trials. Trials have to do with a testing, have to do with adversity and pressure difficulties that we might go through. This particular Greek word that's transliterated as tempted speaks of a solicitation to evil. And that is something, again, that everyone is going to experience, no matter how young or old they are. You know, some people go, I don't have a problem with temptation. Well, you gave into the temptation of stupidity a long time ago, that means. Even Jesus was tempted. Obviously, he didn't give in, he was perfect. But we can learn what to do with this. And so this is, a, this is a reality of life, okay? So let no one say when he is tempted, and now, because this is a common thing people say, I guess, I am being tempted by God. James says, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one with evil. Now, the grammar of this verse is communicating something very important, that God is untemptable. Okay, we just created a word. God is untemptable. He is above the capacity of being tempted. It's incorrect to say for somebody to go, well, God is tempting me. That's incorrect because God doesn't tempt anybody, nor is God even temptable. I remember many years ago, I was in a men's Bible study, and I was the youngest guy there, and everybody was sharing, and this one guy and I don't, I don't like to ever correct people publicly, but I had a Popeye moment, you know, when I can't stands no more and you got to say something. Well, this guy went, man, I'm, this happened in my life and I'm doing this because of God. God made me do it. And I couldn't stands no more. So I had to say, 
First thing I said was, because when I let it go, I let it go, I said, that's ridiculous. And the second thing I said was, that is incorrect. And I pointed to this verse. God didn't tempt you. He didn't tempt me. We can't blame God. We have to take ownership of it. And see, that's the key. If you're going to advance past temptation, because again, everybody's going to be tempted, let's take ownership. We don't be blaming God. Obviously, it's incorrect to blame God because he, he don't tempt anyone. He can't be tempted. Now we find out what's behind it. Verse 14. But each person is tempted when he is, say the rest of it with me, Lord and enticed by his own desire. Now notice that, by his own desire. Can't blame God. It's something that's within us. A lot of times we want to blame what's on the outside. Don't be concerned about what's going on on the outside. Be more focused on the traitor on the inside. That's the real issue. That's what James is telling us. But he uses two words here that I want to just share with you. First of all, the word Lord that you just read comes from the Greek word ekaleto. Can you say that with me? Ekaleto. Ekaleto was used in primitive times. In the Obviously, it's transliterated over here in the Greek, the word Lord to the English. It was used as a, it was a hunting term. You would set a trap and you would catch the animal. The second word that's used here, entice, comes from the Greek word delezio, and that word was common to be used with fishing. And so the understanding is, is that a trap and a bait is being set to catch. Now, I brought my fishing pole just to illustrate this for you, okay? So here it is, and don't worry, it's not a live worm, Millie, okay? Don't worry about that, all right? But <laughs> When you, when you think about fishing, and you can throw the picture of, there's the boys, we've been fishing quite a bit lately. Um, you know, and there's Joe being a good brother, helping his brother, you know, take the fish off the hook, okay? But, you know, when you go fishing, you know, you don't just, you know, drop the, the hook in there and hope somebody comes on it. Um, there's bait that's put there, and that bait um, will attract, hopefully attract the fish, and then the hook gets in. But that's how it works. There's a bait that's there. And that's how the enemy works with us. He, he leaves the base there. The enemy's patient. And when the enemy feels us a little tug on it, he begins to reel us in. That's how it works. He reels us in. He gets his hooks in us. But we don't blame the hook. The hook didn't necessarily catch the fish. What ultimately brought the fish to the hook? The bait. And so what's the bait? Well, the bait isn't God. Some people blame their circumstances. The bait isn't the circumstances. The bait isn't even the devil. The bait, James tells us, is what? Our own desires, our flesh. And if we're feeding our flesh, well, the desire to do something stupid, to do something we're going to regret, is going to increase significantly. We have to make sure that we're not blaming God or anybody else when we step into something stupid. We must realize that the bait is really our own desires. The enemy's using us against us. Could be our fear, could be our past. Uh, a lot of times people go, well, you know what? This is God's fault. I was born this way. You know, you keep talking like that. I keep talking like that. I'm never going to overcome my temptations. I'm going to keep getting beat by them. I'm going to let society and the world dictate how I walk with God because the bait is my own desires, my own sinful desires. That's what James is telling us. Verse 15, then desire when it has conceives, gives birth to sin. So he's using a terminology all of us are familiar with, the birth of a child, but in reference to sin. It's conceived and gives birth to sin, and sin when it is fully grown, when it matures, brings forth death. Now in my James journal, which I encourage you to get uh, the journals of each book of the Bible, it's a great way to study the Bible, I have written down six steps with sin, how it all works. The first one is desire. That's what James says. It starts there. We have, a des we have desires. Starts there. Then deception. That's what the, this, by the way, it's not a real worm. Don't worry. Okay. Th that's what this is like. In fact, I brought some extra ones here. Okay. I'm not going to give them away. They're expensive. Okay. Inflation. But, um, the, you know, I think the enemy knows, he knows what baits maybe work for us, but ultimately it's our own desires. And so it's desire, then it's deception. Then design, okay? Designing the perfect situation for us to fall into. 
And then comes the decision period. Am I going to bite? Am I going to get on the hook? And if I, once I get on the hook, that's disobedience. And then potentially it could be death, death of a relationship, death of an opportunity, death of a promotion God may have had for you, whatever it may have been. And the enemy reels us in. But again, the key is understanding that phrase, own desire. It goes on to say in verse 16, do not be deceived, my brothers. So we don't want to be deceived into thinking it's my, I I didn't have enough sleep. Sometimes people, you know, they're mean to people. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't have enough sleep. No, you're mean because you're mean. That's why you're mean. I was grumpy. I haven't eaten yet. No, you're grumpy because you're a grump. That's why. And you got to work on that. You know, a lot of times we, I worked all, you know, I came off a double shift. Well, you know what? How about you work on your attitude? Because your maturity shows up when we're most vulnerable, doesn't it? And so it's interesting how we scapegoat things on God, on our circumstances. People even blame the devil. I heard one time um, about this, um, and it's kind of a worn illustration, but it was about people who were coming out of church and they were talking to the pastor and they were shaking the pastor's hand and one guy was like, I'm so sorry I was late. The devil hid my keys again. Oh boy. Well, that sounds a little ridiculous, to be honest with you. Please don't tell me that. Okay, that's a little ridiculous. Okay. And then somebody was like, well, you know what? You know, man, I tell you, I just, I, I just had a rough week. You know, the devil, he did this and he did that. Okay, blaming the devil. Another guy blaming the devil. That's why I couldn't come to the prayer meeting. The devil had me run around all week. No, you couldn't come to the prayer meeting because you either forgot or you made other plans. Don't blame the devil for that. Okay. And then somebody else came up to the pastor at the end of the service and was like, they would shake his hand. They go, oh boy, I keep giving into this sin and that sin. Oh boy, that devil's working overtime on me, pastor. Pastor rolls his eyes. And then the devil was up in the tree outside the church. The devil was crying. And the pastor goes, why are you crying for? He says, because your congregation blames me for all their problems. That's why. I think that's how we are sometimes. We blame God. We blame our circumstances. We blame the weather. We blame the government. We blame the devil. We got to take ownership. And we certainly want to make sure that we're not making the mistake of forsaking who God is. Because look what it goes on to say here in verse 17. Can we say this verse together? It's a beautiful verse, by the way. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Now, underline that phrase, Father of lights. It's a Jewish title uh, that became really an affectionate description of God. He's the Father of lights because he created the lights, uh, the moon, uh, the stars, the sun. And even though there are lights, they, they fade away, there's no fading with God. His light will always shine because it is eternal. And so what James is saying is, how could the God, who's the father of lights, who every beautiful gift you get in your life, including light, how could that same God be the God who tempts with evil? The two don't make sense. They can't coexist because they're polar opposites. He's the God that gives, not the God that that wants to take from you in that respect with sin and temptation. And so it's incorrect to think that way. Verse 18, of his own will, he brought forth by the word of truth, that's the scriptures, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. James uses the word we, and he's writing again. Remember we said to these, these believers, these Jewish believers, these were some of the very first conver- converts after, I was gonna say convicts, not convicts, converts, okay. Some of the very first convicts, no, some of the very first converts Jewish converts after the resurrection of Christ. These these are the first ones. He says, we're the first fruits. Remember, Jesus had to appear. James is his half-brother. James didn't even believe he rose from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 7. Jesus had to do a house visit and visit his own brother. James says, we're among the first fruits of the new creation in Christ. Why would God, who gives salvation, want to tempt anyone with sin? And so write this first principle down. If you're going to advance past temptation, write this down. Beware of developing a blame-shifting syndrome. Say that with me. Beware of developing a blame-shifting syndrome. Some people, again, they blame, blame this and blame that. This one's fault and that one's fault. I read an interesting article that was uh, taking aim at blame, okay? And it said this. 
If a man cuts his finger off while slicing salami at work, he blames the restaurant. If a man smokes three packs a day for 40 years and then develops serious lung problems, he blames the tobacco company. If your neighbor crashes into a tree while driving while he's drunk, he blames the tree. If the grandchildren turn out to be brats without manners, we blame the television. Blame, blame shifting. It's just what our culture does. And we don't want to be the type of people that blame. There are symptoms for this blame shifting syndrome. You'll notice them here in your notes. We blame God, as mentioned earlier, people, circumstances, and even, as I mentioned, the devil. You know, I remember years ago, we went to support this friend who was a part of this play in Long Island. It was a terrible play, and the drive was even worse, by the way, okay? Long Island, my goodness. And we went out there to see this play to be supportive. Did I mention the play was terrible? Did I mention that it was terrible? And we went there, and there was this part in the play where this guy is dancing around the stage and singing, not too well, I might add, um, <laughs> Very off-Broadway play, very off-Broadway play, very far off, okay? And, and he's singing, but he sang this song that I think really summarizes how a number of people think. He, he was talking, in, the, in the, sh the part of the play, he's illustrating all these mistakes he's made in his life, and as he's giving his apologies and he's dancing around the stage, he's singing, but the devil made me do it. But the devil made me do it. As you know, maybe a broken relationship, but the devil made me do it. And then a habit, but the devil made me do it. And this is going on through the whole song. And I thought, that's exactly how many of us think. We want to blame the devil, but we shouldn't. That's, that's a symptom of somebody who has blame shifting syndrome. Blaming our circumstances, blaming the devil, taking the bait over and over again. Listen, we're all going to fail, but if I keep taking the bait, I have a syndrome and I'm blaming other people. And then as we read here about He's the father of lights if we're neglecting God's goodness. We want to make sure that we're not blaming anyone. We're taking ownership. I heard about a little league coach who was um, teaching his players about the finer points of the game, and he was talking with one of the boys on his little league baseball team, and he asked a series of questions to the little leaguer. He said, do you know what cooperation is, what it means to be a part of a team? And the young little baseball player nodded his head in affirmation to the coach. Good, the coach said. Second question was this. Do you understand what, it really, what really matters? That when we win, whether we win or we lose, we do it as a team and we don't point fingers. Do you understand this? The little boy nodded a second time. The coach continued. So when you're at bat and if there's a strike called on you, and even if you're called out and it really was a ball, that you're not going to turn and blame the umpire or curse at the umpire or the catch or anybody else. Do you understand all of that? The little boy nodded a third time. Yes. Good, the coach said. Now go tell that to your mother and father in the stands so they can understand it too. Why is that? Because in, in youth sports, I see a coach in now. Everybody's always blaming the ref. We lose. It's, it's the ref's fault. Okay, it's this fault, that fault. You know, we continue to make excuses. You're never going to win in any game, in any competition, in any field of, of comp playing or whatever, classroom, boardroom, business, or it don't matter. We want to be the type of people that are assuming responsibility. It's foolish to do otherwise. It's doubly foolish to commit acts of foolishness and then blame even God for it. Look what it says in Proverbs 19.3. Why don't we uh, say this verse aloud together? A man may ruin his chances by his own foolishness and then blame it on the Lord. You know, in uh, the, it was a 19, uh, I'm sorry, it was a, a 2018 uh, Harvard Business Journal article, and it stated this um, concerning blame. It said, managers um, who listen well are perceived as People leaders, they generate more trust, instill higher job satisfaction, and increase their team's creativity. Now, notice the combination there. They're good listeners. Well, if you're a good listener, as we get into this next point in just a moment, that assumes that you're not somebody who's passing the buck, that you're not walking around with an imaginary clause in your mind that says, I don't have to take any blame. In a uh, Peanuts cartoon, um, uh, this is a good one here, Lucy I had come up to Charlie Brown with a pen and a paper, and this is what she said. Here is this document. Sign it, 
it absolves me from all blame. Then she goes to Schroeder with the same piece of paper and she said this, here, sign this, it absolves me from all blame. Finally, she comes to Linus, who by the way was my favorite character. He carried around the security blanket. I like that, okay? And he said, here is this, it absolves me from all blame. Sign it immediately. As she walks away, Linus says this, gee, it must be nice to carry around a document like that. You know, there's no such thing, but some people walk around like that in their mind. We got to take ownership. If you are serious about success, especially in overcoming temptation, we need to get rid of that blame-shifting syndrome. Now, as we continue, there's more encouragement here and practicality that James shares with us. Look what it says now in verse 19. Know this. Can you say that with me? Know this. And so it kind of ties what we just read together. So know this connects what we just read, and this kind of connects the two together. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person, now that's every person, by the way, not just people who were born a certain month or people who are new to the faith or have been to faith for a long time or whoever, no, the people you don't like, everybody, every person be, why don't you say this with me? Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Now, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't like this verse sometimes, okay? I, I, want, I, just, I want to be heard, quick to hear. Well, and then notice slow is mentioned twice, slow to speak, slow to become angry. But quick to hear, now this word hear could be translated better as listening. There's a difference between hearing and listening. I can hear a conversation going on with my, um, really, my incredible Italian skill to hear other people's conversations. It's amazing. It's amazing. Okay. I could hear the conversation, but I may not be listening to the conversation. To listen, I, I'm going to use my eyes. I might, my posture might be different. Okay. Listening is way different than hearing. We need to listen to what God is saying. Now, it's going to be hard to listen if I'm always speaking. That goes with any relationship and communication. So I want to be slow to speak so I could hear God. And I want to be slow to anger. Now, circle this word anger. It's not, just, it's not talking about anger to other people, although you can apply that. We should be slow to anger, unjust anger, by the way. But this word, orgia, is speaking of an anger to a truth that brings conviction. I should not be a person who's angry when the word of God brings conviction to me. I shouldn't get angry at the person giving the message. I shouldn't get angry at God or his word. I got to be slow to that anger. Because what this tells us is, is that we will get angry at times. You know, we're going to come to church. We should be comforted. Um, we should laugh. We should have a joy. But there's going to be times that we hear something in the Bible and it offends us, and that's a good thing. We should have, our own flesh should be confronted at times to get it right with God. The message of the cross is going to be offensive to me and to you at times, but that's a good thing. It's going to hurt a little bit sometimes when God's correcting us. It's kind of like going to a doctor when he's got to put something back in place. There might be a little bit of discomfort that's associated with it, but that's going to put you on the pathway to healing. And so we want to be a type of people who are quick to listen. In other words, we won't want to delay listening. Delayed listening will always produce disobedience. We want to be a people who are listening to God. Verse 20 says, For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. In other words, nothing good comes from unjust anger. It will not accomplish the will of God. Therefore, based on this, Put away all filthiness. Now, circle the word filthiness. It speaks of moral defilement. That's what the word comes from. Put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. And that word in the Greek language is kakaya, which means moral evil and corruption. You know, it used to be years ago that evil was kind of kept behind closed doors and it would come out in a sneaky way. Now it's in legislation. 
Uh, now it's in, it's in obviously, on, in addition to laws, it's in our schools. It's all over. You can't get away from it. So never before has there been a time for you and I to be in tune with the things of God, because the last thing we want to do is be swallowed up by all of this. You know, the world's going down the toilet. We don't need to go down the toilet with it. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. And now this, and receive with meekness. Now, circle the word meekness. This reminds me of uh, what it says in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 5, blessed are the meek. We're to have a humble heart as we hear the things of God so that it could penetrate and it could do a work in our lives. So with all meekness, notice this, the implanted word, in other words, God plants a seed with the word, which is able to save your souls. Now let's explain that here. At the point of salvation, we have to understand something. Although it might be simple to say the sinner's prayer, God, I'm a sinner, forgive me. I believe in your son, Jesus Christ, that he rose from the dead. Although the words are simple, you have to understand that the process is absolutely, positively, unequivocally profound. What we mean by that is, is the word of God is living and active. It convicts you and I of our sinfulness. Draw, the spirit draws us to God and we respond. It says in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. This is a living, holy document that has the ability to penetrate my stubbornness and your stubbornness, convict us of sin, but at the same time, comfort us with the truth that Christ died for our sins, and on the third day, he rose again from the dead. With the very truth of God, God plants that seed in us. Salvation begins to grow and take root, but we have to receive it with humility. It's able to save our souls. But that humility that's present in you and I, because when people come to Christ, maybe circumstances or whatever, there's a humility that's there. If you're going to keep growing, you need to maintain that humility and that meekness so you can learn new things. You know, looking, I know lots of people, they look down upon people when they come to church, and this, we, this, could, be, and this could be better, and this could be and that could be better. They're spending all their time, all their years, trying to tell everybody how better it could be, but they're not bettering their own walk with God, and they don't even realize it. And some people are fooled by it. Don't be fooled by the person who has all the suggestions. Look to the person who's seeking God on their knees, okay? Those are the examples worth following. We want to be people who are listening to God. Now, before we go over any further in these verses, write this principle down. Connect belief with listening. Can you say that with me? Connect belief with listening. We want to listen to God. You know, let me make this statement to you right now, and I hope it sinks in. The sheer act of listening intently to God speaks volumes that even the greatest, most polished prayer could ever communicate to God. When you are listening to God, it sends a message to heaven. It really does. And that's a question to ask right now. Am I really listening to God? Or am I just giving God all my plans? Am I wanting God just to bless me after I tell him what I want? I heard a story that puts this in perspective for me. It's about a man named Ernesto Cirillo, who was, in his day, a phenomenal economic developer and a person who had a great handle on agriculture. He was sent to Africa to work with the Zambians to produce a garden that would yield Tomatoes and zucchini, two of my favorite things, by the way. And so he goes there in the 1970s to do this. Within a few months, they had amazing success with the garden. Then one evening, close to harvest time, Cirilio watched helplessly as some 200 hippopotamuses marched out of the river and ate everything and trampled on what was left. He says, we then turned to the the Zambians and said, my God, the hippos. To which the Zambian leader said, yeah, that's why we have no agriculture here. So then Cirilio steps back and he says, why didn't you tell us this? To which the Zambians, Binian leader said, you didn't ask. (laughs) Shalilio later recounted that we went in there with a solid plan. We had good intentions, but we lacked one important, incredible step. We didn't seek to listen. 
Let me share with you today this question. How many of your plans have been trampled on by the hippos because you didn't listen to God? You know, when we talk about listening to God, we think it's just reading the Bible, which is important, and we, 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 we'll cover 100%. But another way to listen to God is to say, God, what is your best? What is your best for this situation? What is your best for this relationship? What is your best for this career move? That is a question of all questions, and you want a way to hear what God says. A lot of times we're ready to charge hell with a water pistol, but God hasn't given the order yet to do it. Save yourself a lot of heartache and ask God these questions. Did not God say, ask, seek, and knock, and it will be given? That's not just about material possessions about biblical wisdom too. Did he not say, we saw last week, if anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask. And he'll give to all generously without finding fault, James 1.5. Perhaps you have had a lot of things in your life trampled on because you didn't consult God. The hippos came out. Well, hopefully today you could stop the hippo problem you got. And we could connect belief with listening. A lot of times people have this very mystical faith. Some of you need to stop really listening to some of the, the things you're listening to. Well, they quote the Bible. So the devil, he quoted the Bible too. How'd that work out? And so we want to be the type of people that are connecting belief because proper beliefs will lead to proper behavior. And proper behavior will lead to faithfulness and strength and peace. And so I want to connect my belief to listening. Now, as you flip over your notes, there's a few more verses in this section here that we want to highlight. Verse 22 says, since we're going to be people who listen, and we're not going to let the hippos ruin everything anymore, but be doers of the word, finish the rest of it with me, and not here is only deceiving yourselves. We don't want to just be a hearer of the word. Again, we want to be a listener of the word. If you're just hearing the word, again, to quote that great theological show, Charlie Brown, remember the teacher when the teacher would talk, walk, walk, walk. Walk, 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 walk. When we're not listening to God, really, that's what we walk, walk, walk out of the Bible. That's what we hear. Walk, walk, walk. You want to be the type of person that's actively listening to God. You want to be a doer of his word. You're connecting the two. If you're not putting God's word into practice, it reveals that either your faith is right now suffering or struggling, or maybe you don't have a legitimate faith at all. It's really a litmus test, if you will. But be a doer of the word, not here is only deceiving yourself. Verse 23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. Oh, look how good I look, how pretty I look. But then, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. You know, it's like, okay, I had a blemish here, I had, I had a cut here, but then you forget, where's that cut again? Where's that problem again? Verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the Bible, the law of liberty, because God's word sets you free. You shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free and perseveres being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. He will be, finish this with me. He will be blessed in his doing. You put a bullseye on your back when you listen to God. You truly do. And there is a listening technique that I want to share with you right here in your notes, okay? Take notice of this. We want to read the Word of God, obviously. Then we want to reflect on what God says. That's kind of reviewing. That's a good thing to do. Reflective thinking is very healthy, by the way. Then you want to rest, and maybe it's a promise God gave you. Maybe it's something God has laid on your heart through His Word that you got to do. Maybe, you gotta, maybe a rededication, or i got to stop doing this. i got to start doing that. I want to rest in what God has said. Then the next part is the respond. But between the respond, I think there might be repentance. There might be recommitment, however God is dealing with you. And then repeat. And so here it is. Read, reflect, rest, respond, repeat. Can you say that with me? Read, reflect, rest, respond, repeat. That is a good way to listen to God, that you want to do that on a continual basis, and it will yield fruit in your life. If you want to beat temptation, listen, temptation's going to come. What was that, you know, that great illustration that was given? You know, you, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you could stop them from building a nest. Okay, we need to be people who are listening to God. If we listen to God, and again, ask those questions, we won't give in to the bait any longer. God will help you and I to rise above it. Now, as we close, there's one more important practical point here that comes from this passage that we want to share 
But let's look at these closing two verses, verses 26 and 27 together from James 1. We're now, we now read this, if anyone thinks, now circle that phrase there, if anyone thinks. As we've mentioned time and time again, the Christian life obviously is a matter of faith, but it's a matter of the mind as well. If anyone thinks he is religious. Now, James's audience would have gotten this because their Their understanding of that was the Pharisees and the religious leaders who went out on the street corners and prayed so everybody could see them. Uh, These same Pharisees, uh, they would give and they would sound a trumpet as they did so. So they understood people who tried to look the part. They would even fast and look disheveled so people could go, oh, wow, what a great believer you are. And so they understood false pretenses, okay? They understood people who gave the appearance of being religious who were anything but. So if anyone thinks he is religious, now he's going to give a very practical understanding of this. In fact, James 3 gives us a whole understanding of this, but, and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. Now, what does it mean to bridle your tongue? Well, we don't have time to go into the depths of this meaning, but to control it, to to, to rein it in. Now, why is he bringing up the tongue? Well, what did Jesus say in Matthew's gospel? The outflow of the heart is coming, what? The outflow of the mouth is coming from where? The heart. So it's a heart issue. If I'm verbally throwing up on everybody by how I talk and treat them with my mouth, guess where that's the problem? My heart. I don't need to go to refining school to work on my manners. I don't need to listen to a TED talk or go to a seminar on how to treat people. I got a heart problem. And what James is saying, which connotes, which which ties in with what Jesus taught, is that it's a heart issue. Your religion's worthless. Why? Number one, practically speaking, no one's going to want to know what you believe if you talk to them like garbage. If every time you open your mouth, you're committing committing verbal arsony on people, burning everybody, gossip, uh, cursing at people, uh, putting people down, breaking them down. We got to use our mouth to build people up, not break them down. The Bible says this, but you... It's an issue of the heart. It's deception in the heart. And so you want to be the type of person that realizes that one of the ways I could beat temptation is that I make sure my heart is right with God. I love God with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, but I have to guard my heart too. And an indication that I might be susceptible to fall to temptation, I can look at how I'm talking to people. That's always a sign that something's wrong in here. People could look great. We could fall for it too. They could look great, but then they begin to speak. The closer you get to them, their heart is revealed in how they talk. And it shows that true Christian maturity shows up in how we treat people. I think you've heard that before from the from up here a few times, okay? Now, verse 27, religion, and now we're going to have an example of what religion is. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and keep oneself unstained from the world. And so let's deal with this here. Orphans and widows, and this, particularly in this culture, represented people who were of the neediest bunch. There was no state farm insurance. There was was no um, fund to collect after the husband died, no lifetime pension to draw from. If you were a widow, you were left to fend for yourself. If you were an orphan, there was no agency. There was no foster care program. There was nothing of that nature. And so widows and orphans represented not only the neediest segment of population, but also perhaps the loneliest and most vulnerable of all the people. And so James is saying, you know why? It's not enough for you and I just to help people when it's convenient for us. We got to help people when it's inconvenient for us, especially people who need us the most. Those are the two people he mentions, those groups, but it's not limited to them. Really just represents, I got to roll my sleeves up because orphans and widows, they were people who were of priority in God's agenda. They need to be a priority in our agenda. And then he says, keep oneself unstained from the world. You know, the world has a lot of evil in it today. And we see it all around us, literally all around us. I, I posted about this and it got a lot of attention. Even here on Staten Island, we have a weed problem, I said. We got weeds growing as high as in you and I. And then there's the smell of weed, you know, walking everywhere. I almost got high walking from my car to the church last week. It's crazy over here, okay? Got a weed problem. And, you know, we look at our society 
it's very easy to get stained from the world and you got to make sure that I'm living my life in such a way that I'm safeguarding myself from that. Now, now, how do you do that? Well, write this last principle down. I got to be about God's business. Can you say that with me? Be about God's business. I don't want to get caught up in the world's business. I want to be about my business. I want to be about God's business. And that will put God rails, if you will, G-O-D, rails in my life that will prevent me from going off the road. No matter how young or old I am, I need to realize that, you know, this is a fallen world and the prince of this air would want nothing more than for me to give in to the bait, for me to get on the hook and as it were, get so distracted with living a life that is contrary to the things of God that I start believing some of the garbage I'm hearing out there today, and my mind is so crossed up, I don't have a singular focus on the things of God anymore. And you know, that's why we see so much division today. It's not because of God, it's because there's a lack of trust in the things of God and the Word of God. And what we must realize is, is for such a time as this, is we need to be people that say, I need to be about the business of God. I need to say, what does God's word say until he calls me home? I don't want to get caught up being distracted with the business of the world because God needs to use me in one way, shape, or form to reach those who have needs. And I can't be about God's business if I'm too busy doing me. And wherever you are in your life and in your journey, God could use you. And God desires to use you and I. But we need to be a people who want to make this commitment. You know, as we close, I heard a story that puts this into perspective for me. It was about this missionary pastor who took the call and relocated uh, to an impoverished city around the world to go reach the people there. And so he set up what was needed in that area, which was a feeding ministry. It became a very robust ministry, by the way. Not only were they going to people, they also had a great receiving center they set up. Again, it fit the context of where they were. Now, as years were going on, he realized something, that this is a young man's sport, okay, doing this type of work. And so he began to raise up a guy who was younger than him. And after training him for a good period of time, he handed off the baton and he went back to the States here in America. And he was gone for a while. And so he had a list of family members who he wanted to reconnect with. He wanted to make sure, you know, well, so-and-so is okay and how's so-and-so doing? And most importantly, uh, do they know the Lord? And so he had a big list of family and friends. And so he went through all the lists, but there was one person on the list that would not answer his calls or emails or anything like that. It was his cousin. Now, everybody has one of those cousins, okay, that they just, you know. And this guy was somewhat ostracized from the family because he burned a number of people with some things. And he isolated himself too with how he acted and you know, he, again, everybody has one. And so he purposed himself that he would, he would go see this cousin. And so he, he took a flight all the way to Chicago and goes to see him. He knocks on his door. The cousin answers the door. And he, his cousin slams the door right in his face before he could even say anything. Not a good first meeting, okay? So he decides, I got to stay here a little bit longer. He extends his stay. And uh, he goes there five or six more times. And then on the last time, um, his cousin finally opens the door and he says, listen, you're taking my time. You don't have much time. Um, and so he figured, you know what? I got to get right to it. And he says, well, I hope you're doing well. He goes, I guess if I don't have much time, I want to know. He says, um, do you know Christ as Savior? And so his cousin looked at him and he grabbed him by his shirt, by the lapels, and he pulled him in. He says, mind your business. And so the cousin said very calmly, the missionary pastor, this is my business because this is God's business. And the cousin let him go. And he says, all right, come on in. And so they, they go in, they sit down, they start talking. For about three to four hours, his atheistic cousin, who's filled with so much anger over things, is peppering him with questions. And he's sharing scripture with him. And after about three or four hours of talking to each other, that cousin put his faith in Christ. Why do I share that? Because we, everybody has somebody in their family that might be far from God or we think is unreachable. You just stick to the orders and be about God's business. Show it in your example. Pray for people. Don't stop praying for family members and people. You keep being about God's business 
And God's the great accountant. He'll work it out. Just keep being about God's business until he calls you home. Because there's no greater cause than for you to be tied to than that of the cross of Jesus Christ. While other people are turning church into concerts and circuses and sideshows, let us remain fixed on the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, the cross. Let us be about that. Let us be about God's business. And when we do that, when you're about God's business, guess what? You're not going to have time to give in to the bait of Satan. You're not going to have time to give in and get concerned with the business of the world because you'll be focused on God's business and there will be no regrets. And when you stand before God in heaven, there will be great, I'm sure, legitimate joy when you know that you spent your remaining years on this earth, because this is, this is quick, You spent your remaining years on this earth being about God's business. God wants to use all of us in some way, shape, or form. He wants us to be the hands to a struggling person, maybe under our own roof, just the love of God. For crying out loud, let's just start by having a good attitude and love people. He wants us to share the message when the Spirit leads us to. He wants us to reflect the message in how we treat people. It, it's, it's no secret. It doesn't take a sociology degree to see the condition that our city is in the condition that America is in. And we don't need to get concerned with it because we know how the story ends. We know that the end for us is really a beginning in glory. And so until God calls us home, let us be committed to the things of God, the business of God. And I promise you this, there will be no regret. And guess what? As a bonus, you and I will advance past the trials and temptations that come our way, because greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. If you believe that, say amen.